Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on the IEA platform with uh, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party uh, in Northern Ireland. My name is Dahi O'Callagh, and I'm the chair of the UK group uh, in the Institute. Uh, I'd like to remind you that um, uh, you can ask questions uh, throughout the presentation, and we will endeavour uh, to put as many of them as possible to Sir Geoffrey uh, during the course of this hour. Uh, I apologise for this slight delay, uh, but now that we're started, I can say that we'll finish about two o'clock, uh, and Sir Geoffrey will talk for about uh, 20, 25 minutes, and we'll then take questions. And the, the complete session uh, is on, uh, on the record. Uh, before introducing uh, Sir Geoffrey, I'd just like to say to him, convey to him my own personal condolences uh, and the condolences of the Institute on the very untimely death of Christopher Stalford, uh, a DUP Assembly member uh, who died earlier this week. Uh, I don't think Sir Geoffrey requires an awful lot of introduction from me. He's very well known, uh, not only in Northern Ireland, he's very well known here in the South. He's always engaged. Uh, with uh, civic society in the South to explain his position uh, on Northern Ireland. And uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome him here. Uh, in this, the third of our sessions with party leaders in Northern Ireland to try and help explain to our members and to the wider public here, uh, what the issues are, what are the concerns uh, of uh, people uh, in Northern Ireland about the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, and about the uh, the future of Northern Ireland. Um, so Geoffrey has spent practically all his life in politics. Um, he started with the Ulster Unionists and then has been with the DUP for practically 25 years. Uh, he, be, he had been a member in the Assembly. Uh, he's been a member uh, of Parliament at Westminster uh, and he became leader of the DUP uh, last year. So Geoffrey, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to welcome you to the Institute uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dahi, and uh, uh, um, I very much appreciate your words of condolence, and I will certainly convey those to uh, Laura Stalford and to the wider family circle, and we really appreciate the warmth of uh, um, your words and uh, also uh, of your welcome. And it's a pleasure once again to join with the Institute of International and European Affairs um, I do so on a day when Europe has been rocked by the events in Ukraine. So um, in a way, I almost feel guilty about focusing in on our uh, um, local difficulties, if you like, uh, when there are um, enormous and huge things happening uh, in Eastern Europe. But um, uh, uh, I will uh, try to stick to my remit, which is to talk about the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol and uh, uh, just as importantly, how um, we can all work together to deliver lasting solutions to the current challenges that we face. Um, from the outset, can I thank the members of the IIEA for their um, uh, uh, joining us today, for taking an interest in Northern Ireland. And uh, I think it is important that we have this kind of engagement, this kind of dialogue that promotes better understanding, because the better the understanding, the better the prospect of together finding solutions. When I last had the pleasure of speaking with you in July 2019, I made clear my desire and that of my party to find a resolution that worked for all parts of these islands. To achieve a lasting solution, that had the collective support of all our people and which could deliver upon the promise of a better future, of course, remains our core objective. In that speech, I observed that when people feel forced down a particular path, that is rarely the route to a long-term and lasting solution. Any agreement which fails to win the hearts and minds of all communities in Northern Ireland will ultimately fail the test of time. And it therefore gives me no pleasure in saying those are the very circumstances that we now find ourselves in today. It has been a long established norm that arrangements and agreements can only flourish when supported by both unionists and nationalists in Northern Ireland. That has been the very foundation 
of any and all political progress in Northern Ireland and must be the template for moving forward if we are to achieve our collective goal. One of the most disturbing characteristics of this period has been the almost total disregard for this fundamental principle. If we are to find a lasting resolution to the questions facing these islands, then we must return to the politics of consensus. It was the late John Hume who championed the idea that instead of a majority rule on either side being the way forward, it had to be the politics of consensus. I fear that has been abandoned to a degree. Humiliation of one side over the other is not the answer either. Reconciliation will only be achieved not through retribution, but through a genuine desire to accommodate people uh, and to uh, achieve a consensus on the way forward. Progress will not be made along the path to perdition. In July last year, when I was elected leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, I made clear that restoring the constitutional balance that was achieved in the Belfast and St Andrews agreements was the only path to stable and sustainable government in Northern Ireland. Many of you here will all be all too, aware, all too aware of the painstaking work and sacrifices made to achieve our current political arrangements. Arrangements which at their heart recognise Northern Ireland's constitutional position within the United Kingdom and respected our unique circumstances. And of course, the principle of consent was at the heart of those arrangements. They are arrangements which also delivered support for the delicate balance of relationships on these islands, whether internal to Northern Ireland, north-south on the island, or east-west between these islands. Arrangements which ensured progress was made on the basis of all communities moving forward together has been the basis on which we have moved forward. But the continued imposition of the protocol upon Northern Ireland has unfortunately cast its long shadow over our political arrangements at Stormont and indeed the everyday lives of our people. The genuine concerns and objections to the protocol cannot be wished away nor can they be ignored. Only by recognizing the fundamental flaws at the heart of the Northern Ireland Protocol can lasting replacement arrangements be made which command the necessary support of people across the community. As the leader of Northern Ireland's largest party, I must stress that the problems of the protocol are not simply confined to unionists, but they affect the everyday lives and livelihoods of everyone in Northern Ireland. It is a non-disputed fact that Northern Ireland uh, purchases from Great Britain are four times more valuable than from the rest of the island. Therefore, any barriers to trade within our largest market, which is Great Britain, inevitably leads to devastating consequences for businesses and indeed uh, real difficulties for consumers. Every day, Northern Ireland is subjected to some new problem arising from the protocol uh, that impacts on a business, a consumer, or indeed a sector of the population as a whole. It is estimated by economists uh, that the cost of the protocol to our economy on a daily basis is in the region of 2.5 million pounds in additional costs, lost opportunities, and of course, the infrastructure that is required to support the implementation of the protocol. Every day, elected representatives like me spend time trying to advise constituents about how to navigate the new and ever evolving arrangements born out of the protocol. At a time when households and businesses can least afford it and with spiraling energy costs, which will be impacted even further by the crisis in Ukraine. The fact that the cost of moving goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland has risen by 27% in the past 12 months since the, um, the protocol was introduced, adds significantly to the cost for households and businesses in Northern Ireland. In the middle of a health pandemic, the protocol has also jeopardised our medicine supply. No business, no household, no person anywhere in Northern Ireland has been able to escape the harm of the protocol. 
and the current situation could dramatically worsen if the grace periods are brought to an end. The £500 million trader support scheme uh, that has been put in place and the so-called grace periods, which have temporarily shielded Northern Ireland from the worst excesses of the protocol, will soon come to an end. There will be no trader support scheme when it is finished. There will be no grace period to protect businesses. And then we will feel the full heat of the protocol and its devastating impact on the economy in those circumstances. The EU has stated clearly that the current number of checks being carried out are only 30% of what they should be. So you can imagine the impact if, we, um, if, if they turn up the volume to 100% of checks. The EU have said they want to introduce uh, charges on parcels traveling from one part of the UK to another. Just this week, an EU spokesperson spoke of the need to police the movement of children's toys into Northern Ireland. I had a situation yesterday with a constituent uh, who has a disability adapted motor vehicle. They needed a component part from a supplier in Great Britain to repair the ramp at the rear of the vehicle so that they are able to be mobile. They were not able to bring that component part from Great Britain because they were not a registered business for customs purposes. And that's just one small impact having a major effect on the life of one of my constituents who is disabled and means she can't operate her disability vehicle at the moment and therefore is confined to her home. Some people may feel that's a small thing, but in the life of my constituent, it's a big thing. Independent reports have concluded that the protocol doesn't at the moment deliver the best of both worlds because it creates a major barrier to trade within our biggest market, the United Kingdom. As a proud Ulsterman, I make no apologies for refusing to confine Northern Ireland and its people to what some might describe as the worst of all worlds. As a proud unionist, I make no apologies for refusing to accept a protocol, which in my opinion, and the opinion of the High Court in Belfast, changes our constitutional status as part of the United Kingdom, and as such represents an existential threat to our place within the union. The High Court has ruled that the protocol suspends key elements of the Acts of Union, and specifically Article 6, which gives Northern Ireland citizens the right to free it freely, freely within their own country. So at the moment, citizens and businesses in Northern Ireland have been denied the right to trade freely within their own country as a result of the protocol. That is the denial of what I regard as a fundamental right in our society. And I don't believe it is acceptable uh, that this right should continue to be denied to Northern Ireland citizens simply to protect the integrity of the EU single market. I don't believe that any country in the world would tolerate such a situation. And I certainly am not prepared to tolerate the idea of an internal customs border in the Irish Sea that separates businesses and consumers in Northern Ireland from their main uh, market in Great Britain. And the longer the protocol remains, the more harm it will do. The protocol will have reoriented our supply chains and our economy away from Great Britain. And that's why I've warned the governments in London and Dublin of the inevitable consequences if the RIC border is not removed. It's why I've given time and space for talks between the EU and the UK to make progress. It's why I have offered practical and reasonable solutions to both sides in an effort to move this situation forward. But I'm afraid that the decision by the, by the EU uh, to dismiss uh, concerns and, and not so far to reach agreement with the UK uh, means that the political institutions in Northern Ireland and the economy are being destabilized on a daily basis. The EU told us that the main purpose of the protocol was to protect the political institutions created under the Good Friday Agreement. It hasn't achieved that objective. It has alienated unionists. It has left unionists feeling that they are significantly disadvantaged by this protocol, that their rights have been diminished, that their constitutional status 
with the rest of the UK has been altered without their consent. And in those circumstances, and in the absence of a consensus on the way forward, then this has an impact on political stability here. The economic prosperity and the political fortunes of these islands are, of course, intertwined. The interests of all our people, North and South, are undermined by the outworking of the current arrangements. The North-South Ministerial Council does not meet at the moment. The executive does not meet at the moment because unionists have lost confidence in the way in which we are being treated under this protocol. I truly value uh, partnership arrangements, working with our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland, and I believe we all benefit from strong British-Irish relationships. But there can be no hiding the fact that recent years have not been conducive to building better relations on this island. The actions taken and the positions adopted by those who frankly should know better to settle old scores or to strengthen their credentials for electoral purposes has undoubtedly led to setbacks. The damage caused to the east-west element of our delicate political settlement in Northern Ireland by the protocol has gravely undermined North-South relations. When I spoke with you last, I said that Northern Ireland should not be used as a pawn in a diplomatic chess match, which one side must win and the other must lose. I said that all concerned parties must pause the clock, step back and look at the bigger picture. Mr. Chairman, my message remains the same today. We can do better than saddle future generations with what might be described as whack-a-mole politics between London and Brussels. Every time a problem comes along, you give it a whack, but it doesn't fix the overall issue and the difficulties created by the protocol. We have previously outlined how we, uh, uh, much we've appreciated the need for the European Union to protect uh, the integrity of its single market, but the UK is also entitled to protect the integrity of its internal market, including Northern Ireland's place within that internal market. And therefore, we need to find solutions uh, that are capable of respecting both. I believe there are such solutions. I spent most of my public life working for solutions and stability in Northern Ireland. And the ultimate goal was to deliver a political settlement that worked for everyone and to foster relations to give people who live here control over their own affairs. Respecting difference and securing consensus became part of the political language in Northern Ireland. Yet the protocol fails to achieve this. The foundation of political progress in Northern Ireland has been moving forward together. But that isn't possible if one community feels it is sidelined or ignored. We must tackle the instability eating away at the heart of our politics if we are to build on firmer foundations. Regrettably, the long shadow of the Irish Sea border is holding us back. The challenges ahead seem many, but the prize to be secured will be worth all the effort because I believe there is scope for enhanced cooperation if we can resolve the issues and problems and the challenges created by the protocol. Now is the time to repair our politics, to reset relations on these islands and to restore fairness for all. By moving forward together, we can build that better future that we all want to see. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you.